And now, Greg, take it away. Thank you so much, Heather. So it's my pleasure to introduce our first panel of the day. Uh, you heard Mayor Garcetti speak very eloquently about issues about, of course, both climate change and also equity. And our first session here, Better Cities, Better Transportation, Better Living, is really going to touch upon the equity and how we basically transform cities for everyone. So with that, I'd like to invite my panelists up. Mayor Plant, Minister Simpson, uh, Mr. Deshaun, Mr. Misghani, please come on up here and we'll start our panel. Um, let me switch microphones. Yes, applause for Mayor Blanc, please. Thank you. Yes, please, here they come. Do we have another No, yourself, please. Um, so as a way of quit introducing this panel, you know, I was thinking of um, at, uh, at UN Habitat 3 a few years ago, um, they enshrined the notion of the right to the city, that you know, the right to the city is the right to be transformed by the city. And transportation is really pivotal to that, to really harness the full energies of cities. We must have vital transportation networks to bring them together. And as part of that, I, I'm going to borrow Mayor Garcetti's phrase, excitement, uh, because when it comes to public transport, we now live in a moment of intense excitement, where public transport in the United States in particular appears to be under threat. We've seen declining ridership of buses in most cities across America. Um, but there's also this incredible excitement about that it's ripe for transformation through new technologies, through new partnerships, this sort of redefinition of that. So I'm very excited here to have on panel, as you can see in the programs, um, Larry Deshawn, CEO of uh, Avis Budget Group, which in this setting is probably best known as the parent of Zipcar, since we're all Zipcarians here. Mayor Plant of Montreal, Minister Kadri Simpson uh, of Estonia, which their incredible experiments in free public transportation, and, uh, and Mohamed Mezghani, who is the CEO of UITP, the global uh, uh, union of public transport. So with that, I guess we'll get started here. Uh, some opening questions. I guess we'll start with, with Mohammed because again, uh, you know, as a UITP, you're seeing this moment of excitement globally in this. And I'm curious about your members when you talk to them, not just in the States, but also you know, North America and Canada, of course, uh, and globally, um, how are they responding to this notion of, of where public and private transportation ends? Because I think there's a joke, I think you told me a few years ago, um, that, you know, that in Europe, uh, you know, we Americans regard you as socialists, um, but you, know, you, you tender out public transportation to private operators and we insist on running it ourselves. So who are the true socialists here? Um, so what, what experiments are you seeing that's working in, in reinventing public transport to improve city life? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Good, good morning, all of you. And sorry to be the first one to speak after Mayor Garcetti. Uh, the, the, the impact will not be the same. <laughs> so uh, thank you for the invitation and for, I'm very happy to, to, to be here. Uh, yes, you're right. Public transport is changing. We are at a turning point. Uh, the uh, demand for mobility is growing. We see it all over the world. And this demand for mobility is growing. And, and if we want to satisfy this demand, we need to develop large public transport infrastructure. I mean, Mayor Garcetti, he insisted on that. And this is the, 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 the case in, 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 in many cities. And we have very emblematic projects like the, the Grand Paris Express or like Crossrail or in Saudi Arabia, they are building six metro lines simultaneously. In China, they built 100 metro lines in 10 years. So there is a global movement towards ma mass transit. But at the same time, we have new expectations. We have uh, a demand for flexibility, for on-demand transport, for shared transport. And, and this is uh, um, making the, uh, the, 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 I would say the way to, to answer this demand for mobility different. Because we need to, to combine this mass transit, which will remain the backbone in our cities because of the volume of people we have to, to, to transport, with this on-demand uh, mobility. And the only way to, and, and this is the only way uh, if we want to, uh, to um, reduce car traffic congestion. Uh, and, and, and to do that, we need really to redefine, you said reinventing, redefine public transport uh, beyond mass transit. Public transport or transit, or, or it's, it's not just the, 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 the high capacity modes, it's also the integration with this on-demand and shared, and shared modes. And if we want to, and, and in a way that we, the, 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 the travelers, will have, uh, can tailor made their, the, the way they travel according to their needs, according to the purpose of the trip, according to the price they are ready to pay, according to the moment uh, of, uh, uh, of the day. And, and to do that, uh, we need to have, uh, to, to rethink the governance, the governance of public transport. Uh, we, we, we cannot stay in a very 
traditional governance where you mentioned Europe, where we have an authority, we call it an organizing authority and, and, and the operators and there is a, a contract between that authority and operator with and, and excluding all these new mobility services. No, we need to, to integrate them and of course then we have to think about who will be leading this integration. Will it be the authority itself, will it be a third party with, uh, with the notion of mobility as a service and with, with the possibility to offer a unique portal where, from which we can access all modes? Uh, so who will be offering this mobility package? Who will be the tour operator? And this is the main, the main uh, question we have, uh, we have to, 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 to address. Well, I say one we've been grappling with for years already. Um, well, Minister Simpson, for those of you who know Estonia, of course, you know it as a technological powerhouse, this entire digital government platform. I must, this is where I give a plug for Estonia, where I am, in fact, an e-resident of Estonia, so I look forward to opening my own business in Estonia someday, I suppose. Um, but also well known for the fact that Tallinn, the capital of Estonia, became the largest city in the world at the time to have free public transport, which now the entire country is expanding to. So I hope you could touch upon that briefly about what that means to make all public transport in the entire country free and what the ultimate goals are for that. Is it you know, the elimination of cars? Is it about equity? I know from the Tallinn experiment that uh, it didn't reduce traffic as much as they'd hoped, but they saw that the biggest users of it were from some of the poorest areas of the city. There was a big equity part of that. So I'm curious what happens when you take that outside of the city into the forests of Estonia. Well, yeah, that's, very yeah, that's very true that um, for several years, um, our capital Tallinn has been the only capital in Europe where public transport has been free for all the citizens. And that um, brought us um, growth of uh, inhabitants, 10%. At the same time, we have seen that uh, the growth of private cars has been only 5%. So um, for several years, we hope that it has stopped congestion and uh, it has stopped uh, and um, changed some kind of a mindset for our citizens. At the same time, um, we have made surveys and we see that um, those private cars that are owned by Italian citizens, they are staying 94% of the time useless. So they are just waiting for their owners to, um, to use them. And majority of the trips that have been taken in Tallinn, in our capital, they are shorter than, five, uh, shorter than three miles. So um, you, should, you should offer another option and uh, public transport might be the one um, so, for every citizen who wants, um, we are providing an electronic card and you can register your trip. So, this gives us information. We know what kind of lines are busiest and, and what hours. And you, you can add lines if, it, if, if it's needed. So, since 1st of July this year, we have uh, provided free public transport in uh, bus lines all, all around our country. And um, it has now worked for three and a half months. And there have, been, there have been counties where the number of passengers have grown 92%. Wow. So um, this is a possibility to change mindset that I can save money if I use public transport. And for us, um, it is very important because we have adopted a very ambitious plan that by 2030, we will use the same amount of um, fossil fuels for transport than we used in 2011. So, uh, yes, maybe easiest option is to provide everyone uh, electric, electric cars. But uh, we have decided that we will um, change the mindset. And um, especially we see that younger generation and female passengers, they are eager to adopt uh, or take back those um, um, traditional ways uh, to commute and use uh, public transport. Of course, at the same time, we have a special strategy for uh, promoting bicycling. But you have to keep in mind that Estonia, we are in not very favorable um, uh, climate. So half of the year, it, it either rains or snows. So um, public transport is a good uh, alternative for uh, shorter trips. A quick follow-up, because uh, I have to ask this as an American, how, how will you pay for this? How do you pay for free public transport? Because this, I think, is often you know, seen as a crazy idea in the States. We insist on the fare box recovery to be higher than most nations. So I'm curious where you saw this. Or, or you know, a talent, of course, it was heavily subsidized. They just decided to make it free. Is this true at the government level, at the federal level as well? Well, even before the, um, uh, the 
public transport became free of charge, it was heavily subsidized. So we got only one third uh, from the ticket money and two thirds were subsidized. So basically, yes, we do subsidize uh, buses, but we also subsidize uh, subsidizing trains and uh, ferries that connect our islands. So uh, we do it because uh, Estonia is um, land-wise pretty big country, as big as Netherlands, but we have few inhabitants, and that's why there is no other option. Uh, the public transport can't be profitable anyhow. Well, the cost of uh, each kilometer is too high. Great. Um, Mayor Plant. There is this incredible nexus, of course. We're talking about making a better city and better living for people. There's that nexus between transportation and land use and housing. And of course, you were elected on a platform of increasing housing and affordable housing in Montreal. Um, here, in, here in California, there was a very ambitious bill proposed in the state Senate that would have dramatically upzoned housing along uh, transit routes. It would have created a tremendous amount of housing and died in committee. And so I'm curious in Montreal, how you're seeing transport combined with your pledge to increase housing and where the opportunities are to you know, expand and amplify public housing, increase the scope of, of developable areas using these new technologies or scooters or things like this and bicycling. Um, how, how are you sort of tackling the two in tandem? Because uh, it's very much a chicken and the egg problem in a lot of places. Yes. Um, so, well, thank you for having me. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, one thing that people need to know, which I find very interesting, is that I'm the mayor of a city of two million people, and I've never owned a car. So it means that it's actually possible to be quite mobile in Montreal because we have, you know, a great public transit system. We have metro lines. We have the bike sharing. We have bike lines. Actually, we are crazy enough to bike during winter. So, and this is growing, growing, it's getting more popular. And so you're right, the fact that there's uh, a lot of people uh, being uh, using public transport and using uh, being really the, the active transport as well is because the housing is really related to how we're developing transport. So though it's been good, we still need to improve that. Where before, for example, within the city of Montreal, there used to be the transport division and then the uh, housing division or the urban planning division. And we've decided to put it together because you cannot develop transport without thinking about the housing and how you will develop areas. And to me, this is where there's such a great opportunity right now everywhere in the world. And I think this is what's happening with LA when we hear the mayor saying, okay, we need to change the way we think about transport and we need to give options. But to me, the best argument is to say when you develop public transport, it's good economically, it's good socially, and it's good for the environment. And, uh, and, and we're feeling that people are now responding to that where 10 years ago it would have been like a crazy idea to say that. Uh, now it's how do we bring people to, um, they love the idea of saving the planet, now it's how does they are willing to uh, leave their maybe privilege of using being alone in their car, um, not necessarily sharing the public space. So this is where it gets challenging. But you're right, I think that our responsibility as a city, and it is for me, is to create, uh, if I think about public transport, I want to create areas where there's more density, there's also different types of housing available because we know that around metro stations, for example, it's much more expensive. So we want to make sure that different type of people can uh, afford to stay in an area well where they won't have to buy a car. They will be able to take the metro or the buses. And so for us, we've been working really closely with the transport division and the housing one. And we have this crazy, uh, bold idea, and actually it's not an idea because we're moving forward, but we will be creating uh, 12,000 units of affordable and social housing throughout the, the city, including close to uh, uh, metro station and public transport areas. So again, I think it's, uh, we're, we just need to, there's a shift that needs to be done. And I have to say, I got elected on a very uh, audacious environmental platform. I was talking about creating a metro line during my campaign and people went for it. It's called the pink line. Watch out, it's coming up. Well, in a few years, but because that will be the next part of the challenges coming with that. But, and I've been able to say if we want a, an affordable city, a great city in the future is based on economic development, housing, and transport. And the three of them, and, and which helps the environment, but are, they're truly interconnected. And so far, again, people are behind us, but it's when we operate it, then 
it's another, uh, it's, it's a challenge, but I truly believe that people are there and it is our responsibility as cities, like the mayor said. It is us, we're, uh, we're dealing with all the, the, the problems like the population is, so we need to bring it to a level and if it means forcing other, the, the other uh, governments to take us seriously, well, we gotta do it. So this is where I'm heading. <laughs> Thank you. Larry, yes, round of applause to the mayor, please. Larry, on the surface, this would appear to be a game of which one of these is not like the others. But, but to Mohammed's point, to my early point here about how public transportation is changing, I'm curious about how Avis budget sees itself as a player in this. Because I think of this, you know, you have a, you have a partnership with Waymo, of course, to handle some of this. But, you know, if we think about, you know, this whole shift towards fleets of electric vehicles, of autonomous vehicles and the technology comes, uh, you know, total transformation of on-demand, total transformation of who maintains it, who charges it. That's a level of expertise that only rental car companies have. And so I'm curious about how you're repositioning the company or thinking about these opportunities to be the service provider, to be that management layer of this sort of public-private mobility stack in cities and, and, yeah, and sort of how that all changes. Absolutely. Um, good morning, everyone. Thanks for having me here. I would like to say I, I took a bike tour of Montreal in July, and it was so easy to get around the city on a bike. So congratulations. <laughs> it, was really, it was really remarkable. Um, that's exactly how we're thinking. Uh, you know, we've been in the mobility business for 70 years, and we've been managing large-scale fleets in 180 countries around the world. Uh, we built the expertise. We built the systems. Um, we built the infrastructure, the maintenance capabilities. We turn our cars very quick. Multiple people are in our cars you know, every day. And so when you think about mobility in the future and how technology is helping you know, grow new mobility solutions for us and for other mobility partners that we have, um, whether it's autonomous, electric, or whether it's diesel or, or petrol, it doesn't matter. Someone has to buy the cars and infleet the cars and maintain the cars, clean the cars, handle the recalls, all the things that happen. Uh, and there's no companies really, there's only a handful of companies in the world that can do that at the scale that we do it. So when we met with Waymo, that was a great example where you know, they, that wasn't their expertise, nor did they want it to be. Um, and so why recreate the wheel when we have you know, 11,000 locations that we can actually manage fleet through? And so other fleet, uh, other fleet or other mobility uh, partners out there are thinking about in the future when we get to autonomous vehicles and their supply chain is gone because the driver is no longer in the mix, and that's who their supply chain is today, who's going to do all this for them? And, uh, we're, we're absolutely building out that capability. And I think, you know, technology is, is developing so fast that, you know, as we think about our own company and, and where we can meet mobility needs in the future, we're no longer thinking about rental car or just car sharing. We're thinking about how consumers want to consume mobility in the future. Now, we're not going to provide mobility solutions in all cases, but as people give up their primary car or even their secondary car, they need more and more mobility solutions. And I look at millennials who don't want to own cars. I have two millennials. Both of them don't want to own a car. Uh, and when they gave up their car, they rented from me four times the next year. Now they take advantage of car hailing and car sharing and other mobility solutions, but we're in the mobility business, so we win when the mobility pie gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So it comes about how do you provide mobility solutions to consumers the way they want to consume mobility. Uh, they want it on demand. They want it digital. Uh, they want it clean and safe and reliable, and they want it close to where they are, you know, convenient and simple and easy to use. And that's, that's the journey that we're on. We're reinventing the entire process so that we can actually provide mobility to people in a very fast and easy, simple way on their app and partner with others so that you fill out the entire mobility ecosystem so that there's one solution really that they can go to for no matter what their use case is. Great. Well, I, so, so winding up here, we have about 20 minutes here, so I have some uh, questions. I recently hosted a series of dinners with our media partner, City Lab, where we brought together public, public officials and private transportation executives, private mobility services, and it was like basically moderating group therapy discussions uh, as they basically hashed out their various differences in this. And I'm curious, going back to Mohammed's take earlier about you know, the notion of you know, mobility as a service and governance, and the fact, for example, that, you know, that we've seen over the last few years with cities to give you the broad narrative, and John and the mayor touched upon this, is you know, we saw the arrival of you know, potentially disruptive ride-hailing services that came into cities. Cities tried to push back and didn't. Then came the scooter companies, and now we've seen this sort of almost you know, uh, 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 counterproductive uh, regulation that's happened with them, with caps, uh, with various ways of trying to rein them in. And I've, and I've heard over and over this notion of we need to have more performance-based regulation. Cities need to articulate what are the outcomes they want 
and then create the frameworks in which private mobility can plug into this. And, and I guess I'm curious from each of you, if, if you talk about you know, your, your thoughts on how we can create these frameworks where we can finally get to a place where we're not just hashing it out over who has what rights and who, who, you know, who can be part of this, but creating this sort, of, this sort of system that people can plug into. Here in Los Angeles, for example, you know, you'll hear from Salita Reynolds. She's created the mobility data specification at LADOT to create the data that will allow the city to basically manage scooters and other forms of transportation. So there's a technology component, a governance component, regulation. I don't know if any, anyone has particular thoughts on this. I have, I could think for each of you, but if someone wants to jump in, I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts on who's creating these frameworks that could work so that we don't come back next year and you know, repeat, this, repeat this conversation. Okay, thank you. Um, I think we should, we should end this uh, uh, debate or between public and private. Uh, at the end, we are all, tar I mean, this public and private uh, stakeholders, they are all targeting the same people. They are all targeting the citizens, the travelers. And the citizens, they don't care about who is the operator, if it is a private or public operator. What they want, they want quality, they want reliability, safety, comfort, etc. And so we, we, need, we need to, 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 to really uh, have a system, have an, uh, a body which is this authority this integrated authority that should look to this integration between the public and, and, and private. And I mentioned earlier this mobility as a service. What is uh, the added value of mobility as a service is that the, uh, the, the user or the traveler will not have to decide in advance uh, which mode they want to use, which, uh, which, which solution they want. What, what they, they pay a lump sum amount, I would say, for a monthly subscription where they can have unlimited travels with public transport, they can have a number of hours of bike uh, from the bike sharing system, a number of, uh, of, uh, of days from car rental system, uh, a number of, uh, of hours using uh, electric scooters, etc., taxis even. So, and we see this kind of, of uh, mass products uh, um, developing uh, in, in some cities. We take the example in Finland, for example. Uh, in Finland, they have a, they have a a law since the 1st of January where anyone can buy public transport tickets and resell them with a commission. And it, it's, it, it's, not, it's not, I, I mean, it's a unique example. And, and this made third parties uh, uh, acting as tour operators, you know, and offering an all-inclusive service because they are allowed to do that. And this kind of, of, of approaches, we see it in Vienna, we see it in Hanover, in, in Germany, in Singapore, and in each city they, are, they, have, they follow a different scheme. In Finland, it's a third party, a private company who is providing this. In, in Vienna, it's a, they call it a public startup. You know? It's a public entity. And so I, I, I don't, we should, we should really think about what people expect and try to develop the right scheme to offer them what they expect. All right, but quick follow-up on that, but I mean, that, that happens in Finland, and, and Christo is the head of global business development from, for WIM, who was in the Finnish government, is here, so if you're really interested in this in the audience, you can find her at some point in Corral on this. But my understanding is, I mean, there's a federal Finnish law that mandated to do that, and, you know, and of course, Vienna has its own legal structure, too. From, from a recommendation standpoint, does this mean, you know, yeah, we need to change federal laws in the United States and or Canada and or Estonia for this? I mean, you're getting at the heart of this. Cities can only do so much. That was a federal law in Finland. I, I, of course, I don't know the specificity of the, of the uh, USA in this, in this field, but it could be also the main transit operator who is offering this kind of, of mass. It doesn't mean necessarily that we need the private, uh, a private entity. Uh, we, we have in France now... Uh, um, um, operators like Transdev or Keolis, they are trying to develop, and, and in Mulhouse, for example, I think it's Keolis, sorry if Transdev is here, Transdev, of, one of them, it's Transdev, sorry, it's Transdev, who developed uh, a, mass, a mass product. So, yeah. so it, it, any, any um, stakeholder could be, uh, it could be possible for any stakeholder to, to develop this kind of approach. Thank you. Valid. Without necessarily changing the law, sorry. <laughs> Uh, well, I agree that, uh, that we, we need to work together. I think that uh, public and the uh, the private sector needs to work to, together to find to address uh, you know issues that can be solved only together. There's power that you know the the, the public have versus the private has uh, different ways of seeing it. But all to me, all, ultimately, it's all complementary. And and I have to say, it's music to my ears when I hear the private sector saying, uh, you know, like we, we need to find solution for people's need. Because as an elected official, my priority is to make sure 
that it's people's needs first. And I think we've seen it in the past where cities uh, did adapt to cars, for example. It was all made, you know, because of how the needs of, you know, if you want to drive in a city. Where now, I, I don't want the, for example, the, the, the autonomous vehicle or the electric vehicle to say, follow the same path. We need to, it has to be the technology that adapts to people's need. I really think this is where we're at, but there's so much potential. And, and for us in Montreal, um, and I, I was just talking about autonomous vehicle, we're in a place where because of our climate, we, we can do so much testing and working with the private sector is just perfect. The fact that we can do some urban setting uh, uh, testing as well. Uh, the fact that we have a lot of uh, uh, artificial intelligence as well. We're really, it's a big hub in Montreal with Joshua Bengio, if you know him. I'm sure a lot of people know him. Everybody knows him, I guess. <laughs> and the intelligence, uh, artificial intelligence as well. So there is... In Montreal, there's a lot of uh, potential, but I, I really fear we're at this place where it doesn't have to, to be the private that against the, 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 the public. As long as we can sit at the same table and share our objectives, I have to say it is a, cha a challenge around sharing data. Of course, it is a challenge. We need to, and everything related to uh, um, la, um, uh, your private information, that uh, how do you want to share it, right? But we can go through this, and we can definitely find solution for the good of the, our population uh, in across cities and countries. No. I was just going to add that um, you know public and private sector initiatives and goals don't have to collide; they can be very complementary. We operate the leading car share company globally around the world, and our Zipcar team has great relationships with cities all over the world that they work with to to provide solutions to challenges that they have in their city. A good example is. Zipcar is now providing cars in under, uh, underserved areas of New York City. So they're putting cars at public housing uh, developments. And they're actually doing quite well. And it was just a place where people didn't have access to transportation, and we're providing now that access for transportation. So as our Zipcar team sits down with the city and really tries to understand what, is, what are your goals and what can we do to help you, uh, yes, we have different constituents that we have to satisfy. I have shareholders, and you have, you know, the the public, you know, citizens that vote for you, and we all have, you know, our constituents. We have to meet their needs, but these don't have to collide. They can be very complementary, and solutions are there, and technology is there, enabling us to find solutions. Minister Simpson, I was particularly whatever you're going to add. I was going to ask in particular, um, you know, have you has has Estonia built out any particular digital frameworks for mobility in this? Because you know, there's a lot of work. Again, I mentioned what LA is doing and others, but there's a lot of discussion about we, you know, we still lack standards. We still lack, you know, some basic plumbing on this. And obviously, Estonia is so far ahead of this that I'm curious about, you know, given the fact that every citizen has a digital ID that links into so many services, has it allowed you to basically balance the system to to really sort of collect people into public transport and sort across multiple modes that other cities or states are still grappling with. So what, what can we learn from Estonia's sort of digital infrastructure? Well, that's very true that um, in Estonia, we do believe that legislation shouldn't lag behind the real life. And at the same time, our uh, citizens are very open with their um, private information. So you, you might know that in Estonia, we have e-voting. That means that you can give your vote via internet and you trust the system. And the same is with public transportation. You are driving. Um, you are registering your ride, and you know that someone sees what time you are taking this bus and to where you are going. And there are no worries that someone will use this information against you. So um, uh, talking about le legislation, we have legalized um, different new uh, um, modes. For example, in our streets, there are um, traveling parcel robots. And these are part of our traffic with no problem. But at the same time, we don't have yet existing mass because, uh, well, um, the ticketing system is uh, privatized. So every company sells its own um, um, tickets. And they don't want to share their knowledge. So you have to help them with the legislation. Otherwise, uh, companies are competing, and they are not so eager to, um, to find the common ground. And this is definitely problematic for our passengers because, well, um, you are buying your ticket online, but you don't know all the options. Um, Mayor Plant, I have a question about particularly building public support for transit from a political standpoint. So here in Los Angeles, of course, we're in a special place where 70% of voters voted to tax themselves with Measure M to raise $100 billion. I live in New York where subways are collapsing and our government doesn't seem much to care. They have other priorities when it comes to uh, economic development, we should say. Um, I'm curious, you know, in, in 
LA is a success. We've seen in other cities around the United States, for example, Nashville comes to mind, where their uh, opponents of a transit referendum last year used same tactics that they use in the presidential elections of creating fake accounts, of, of creating misinformation to battle transit initiatives. I'm curious when it comes to building public support and making the case of that, how have you done that and how you see that as changing in an age of digital elections and everything else to make sure that people understand these benefits and it's not fear, paranoia, and disinformation? Um, well, I think the best argument is just to, um, you, need, you need to share, like, um, bring the story to another level and um, the fact that people are stuck in traffic, because though I'm talking about my city as a, you know, where there's a lot of options, there's still a lot of, there's traffic problems for sure. And actually the number of cars is growing uh, more than the, the population itself. So that is a problem. Um, so I think when I say about sharing the story is how do we connect with the population to come up with um, solutions together. To me that is very important. And it's also where in the past I find that we would talk about public transit as a way to, um, for some people, you know, some, not all the population would be attracted to that. It would be maybe for not uh, the richer or maybe a certain kind of people would take the public transit where now everybody's stuck in traffic so it's not a good thing and i like to bring the economic side of what it costs to be stuck in traffic it's about just for montreal it's about four billion dollar a year of lost money because people are late at the, in the office because they weren't able to pick up the kids and they have to pay extras, you know, all these things. So to me, uh, using the economic side is very important as well as pushing the governments because that's the thing in Montreal. I, though I'm all about public transport, I don't have the ability financially to do it. So I need to convince the provincial and the federal. Um, federal is pretty good. Uh, provincial, we're working on it to convince them that it's a good investment. but. It's, it's to tell them, like, you know, um, pub, uh, a population that is mobile, um, you know, through an efficient way, like public transport, well, it means that uh, it's more money for the economy. As well as, for me, I'm bringing a lot the social side of developing public transport. When you create a, a metro or a tramway or a bus line in an area where maybe it's very dense and very isolated, then it supports a whole community. And then it opens up opportunities for businesses, for more work, for or, you know, it's just great. So to me, it's really about how do we talk about public transport? And I talk about public transport because it's really dear to my heart, but I have to say, it's the whole uh, mobility cocktail, whatever it's car sharing, whatever it's taxis, whatever it's the, the bikes or the, the scooters that you have in LA. So how do, we, do we, we talk about the whole shebang, the whole thing, everything that is possible and available for the population to be mobile and active, and then it's a health issue, right? We want people to be active. So in Montreal, I feel like this is, it resonates. Oh, and the environment, of course, environment, because people are there. They, they want to have solution. And for us in Canada, it's not about changing the source of energy because we have uh, hydroelectricity. If we want to commit and reach our objective of uh, reducing uh, greenhouse gas emission, it's about transport. That's the only way to reach our objectives. All right, so quick final question that for the other panelists in, in that particular vein. We've talked mostly about carrots, but I want to touch upon sticks for a moment here about um, policies to basically reduce car trips and reduce mobility of that. So congestion pricing, mileage-based pricing, uh, gas taxes, uh, Minister Sims was saying about the, you know, the incredible expensive excise tax compared to the states on fuel. Um, I was wondering if the three of you have any particular thoughts on basically the way to go forward with this. I don't want to get into a discussion about autonomous vehicles. We hear a lot of that over the course of the conference. But you know, it's presumed that every scenario with AVs in particular, there will be a need to basically rein them in using various forms of pricing. So any particular thoughts on, on best practices looking forward about how we should do that? Should we, you know, gas taxes seems to be in decline in the United States because of the shift to electric and elsewhere. Um, you know, again, Estonia, you know, any particular thoughts on, on how you might implement uh, congestion pricing in Tallinn or across the country, given the fact that you have, again, the digital technology and the small size and, you know, sort of seems like the right ripe circumstances? Well, um, when, I, when I was arriving to LA and I saw fuel prices, then uh, they took me by surprise because they are so cheap. Um, back home, we are adding a lot of uh, taxes to uh, fuel prices, and this is definitely one uh, reason why um, several households are still preferring um, to share cars. They're not driving um, one car, one person, because this is just too costly for their um, family budget. Uh, but um, talking about cities, then 
even in Thailand, we do have uh, traffic jams sometimes. But we have special lines for public transport. So if you are um, choosing a very comfortable way and you are traveling alone in your car, then you might sit in the car, uh, well, long hours. At the same time, your neighbor at um, public transport, he, he knows uh, that buses or trams, they are exactly on time because they have free uh, lane. And this is one, uh, one very positive thing um, um, next to the free ride. Um, and of course, we are, uh, we are also um, um, hoping that um, more and more people will use um, um, bicycles for the last mile. Uh, that's why we have uh, those uh, rental bikes everywhere. You can um, rent them with uh, the same card that, um, that uh, provides you free ride. So you have electronic card that is um, usable for different uh, uh, transport modes. And most, most people in the capital, they do use it, and now it's popular around the state. So um, these kind of options uh, uh, will, will most probably lead us to the situation where private cars are not, the number of private cars are not um, growing so f rapidly. And of course, um, I totally agree that um, in um, environment uh, point of view, we should um, promote um, renewable uh, energy. And uh, that's what we're doing in public transport, uh, definitely, but also in um, uh, company cars, because they are uh, they are traveling longer routes, they are um, uh, op operational longer hours, and, uh, and to um, convince um, companies to use, uh, I don't know, electric cars or um, LNG cars, this is also one option for us. Thank you. We're almost out of time, but Mohammed quickly, and I'd like to hear from Larry too. But Thank you. Yeah, just one word about this debate about energy. And uh, uh, yesterday when I arrived, um, I, it took me one and a half hour to go from the airport to my hotel. And uh, would, have been, would it be different if those cars were electric? No. Uh, so it, it, a, a clean traffic jam is still traffic jam. So I think we should not, we should not uh, try first to solve the energy issue. Or, or the CO2 issue, and then try to, 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 to fight the, the traffic congestion issue. We should do that uh, simultaneously. And the only way to do it is to, to, to carry people in mass transit. I'm sorry to repeat it again. But of course, it's better if the cars are electric, if the mass transit itself is, is, is electric. Huh? But we, we, we cannot separate the, the problems. Larry, quickly, how do you think that the sort of the taxing funding issue, I mean, Avis budget has huge fuel bills and it has more experience with tolling in its cars than anyone with various, uh, you know, easy pass in New York and others. So I'm curious what you guys are looking at, how you think that particular technology will evolve um, when it comes to electrification and also uh, mileage-based pricing. Um, you know, I, I think it's all about, you know, the, I think the technology will help actually just consumers change behavior. Um, and, I, and I think... You know, we're, we're a bit in the wild, wild west at the moment because the um, mobility solutions and offerings and technology is advancing so fast that um, the, the cities aren't really geared for it yet. You know, they're not ready for it yet. Um, and, I, and I do think it, it can't be the wild, wild west. It has to be organized and it has to have the right partnerships and everyone working to meet the right uh, objectives here. Um, and, and you know, with Zipcar, for example, when we put a Zipcar car on the road, we know that it takes 14 cars off the road. Uh, that study has been done from a, you know from an external capability, and um, so there it, it is good for the environment. It is a good mobility solution. I agree with Mohammed that you know you, you can't have um, you know you you move into a city like when I moved to London. The first thing I would looked at when I was looking for an apartment is where, how am I going to get around? What are my mobility options going to be? I want to live close to the tube. And so people are looking for mobility options, easy, you know, reliable, safe, clean mobility solutions when they, when they move to an urban environment. And urban, you know, uh, um, uh, people living in urban environments is growing just rapidly. I think the top 750 cities in the world produce about 57% of the uh, global GDP, and that's only gonna keep growing. So these environments have to work. And if you move into an environment where you have no access to mobility that meets your needs, or you move into one that's completely congested, I mean, that's not a solution for anyone. So I just think that we, we have to work together and we have to find ways of which to meet each other's needs. And, and we can do that through the technology and mobility use cases that are coming online, but it has to be organized and controlled. All right. 
We're almost out of time. I understand that Mayor Plant has a video that we should see here, that you want to sing the praises of Montreal. I can't get enough of, of Montreal myself. Video? So Ooh. so before we depart, I believe <laughs> I, I'm told that we might actually see a projection here of the wonders of Montreal. Is that true? Will something come up here in a moment? <laughs> here we are. The future of uh, mobility, transportation, it's a great place to be. All of that is happening in Montreal right now. And we're there to support them. We're there to invest in those companies so they will come here. And we, we are very active in the world. For any computer, cell phone, or electric vehicle inside the body, at least one element was invented in our center of excellence. So Montreal has uh, all the assets to rapidly test mobility concepts. Uh, let us start with a uh, testing uh, of uh, safety features roughly 25 kilometers away from Montreal. And then you can bring the technology downtown. So this is quite a unique opportunity we have here to offer to those stakeholders willing to test things, uh, namely to have access to this pool of support within a very short range. So the ecosystem is already there. You add on top of that, Quebec City itself is known as a photonics and optics hub. So it makes us a very good environment for uh, technology companies who want to establish themselves here. You have also a wonderful uh, energy mix here, which allows us to develop sustainable mobility. Plus, you have an artificial intelligence cluster, which is also very attractive for big corporations. Last but not least, a wonderful academic ecosystem and we're seeing big players from Asia, from Europe, from North America starting to knock on our doors and we can demonstrate to them the ecosystem we have in artificial intelligence and it's a great one. And we can show them as well the ecosystem we have in mobility. And when you combine both of those together, it's just wonderful. We have the know-how, we have the resources, it's all here, capital is available and it's been you know, growing at lightning speed. So all the components that you would need in order to provide these kind of services are there. Well, <laughs> it was pretty wise uh, from our team to shoot during summer, right? Because uh, it really feels like... I was going to say, there should have been a lot more photos of SUVs spinning out in snow, I feel yes. like would have been appropriate. Um, well, with that, please, a round of applause for our panelists again, for Larry, for Mayor Plant, for Minister Simpson, for Mohammed. Um, thank you so much. I'll try to keep things moving along here. We're already always, every conference is a little bit behind time.